Well, I bring back to you this morning a word from the retreat. And the theme of the retreat this year is obedience, not sacrifice. And it comes from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, where God says to his people, I have not required sacrifice of you. What I want is obedience. And let me read it to you. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips as you know, O oh Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, Aha, be appalled at their own shame. May, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, The Lord be exalted. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. Do not delay. What does it mean to obey the Lord? Have you ever thought about that? What does it mean just in general to obey? We don't like that word, do we? Obey. Does anybody like that word, obey? Because it, it, it's kind of a, it's a tough word sometimes. It usually infers that we're not obeying. Are we, you know, listening? But it, it comes from, I think, back, you know, when we were kids. You must obey your parents. The Ten Commandments, obey your father and your mother. But what do obedience and love have to do with each other? Obedience and love. Well, if you think about love, I mean, love here in the United States is probably something that we talk about a lot, isn't it? Love. What is love? What is falling in love? What does it mean to love? Are you loved? Does he love me? Does she love me? We think about it a lot. And if you ask therapists, it's something that they hear a lot in their, in their practice. A lot, a lot, a lot in their practice. What is love? Who gives love? Who gets love? When is it really love? Really, how do we know? How do we know when it's love? When we, when we think we're in love with each other, we start to do lots of things for each other. We get mushy and we send poetry to each other like this one. Listen to this one from Emily Dickinson. It's all I have to bring today, this and my heart beside, this and my heart and all the fields and all the meadows wide. Be sure you count, should I forget, someone the sum could tell, this and my heart and all the bees which in the clover dwell. Isn't that sweet? It's sweet. It's mushy. Something that someone would send to you when they, they're beginning to fall in love with you. When we hear the word love. We think about all the experiences that we've had throughout our lifetime where we were loved, where we are loved, where we were not loved. Those are tough experiences. Those are tough memories, aren't they? We know what love is not, don't we? We know what love is not. But do we always know what love is? Can you agree with me that we don't always know what love is? We don't always know. But we do. We bring each other gifts. We bring each other cards. We want to show an expression of our love or our affection for another person. And we think about it a lot. How can I get it? How can I give it? How can I live without it? How can I be single? How can I be unloved? How can I do that? We all know we want something out of love. 
But let's take a moment this morning and translate the love that we know as human beings for each other and from each other. Let's think about that this morning, that word love, that concept that we talk about, and let's move it from our love for each other to our love for God. How do our earthly relationships relate to our love for our Heavenly Father? Years ago, the first time I ever read Psalm 46 through 8, obedience, not sacrifice, I became confused because I didn't understand. I knew all about the Old Testament. I knew about the sacrifices that God required. And it seemed to me that it was a contradiction within his word. And I found myself at that time in need of an explanation for him. Well, how can you tell me that you don't want sacrifices when you told me all through the Old Testament? And, by the way, God, need I remind you, you took us through great length to explain every single sacrifice that we need to make in order to do this, to do that. I mean, let's go through some of them. A pigeon, a dove, the lamb, the cow, the heifer, the bull. And there were specific ways that the Israelites were to prepare it, to slaughter it, to get it ready. It had to be a lamb without defect uh, or an animal without defect. Well, what happens if they couldn't find an animal without defect? Well, that's a lot of animals that had to go to be sacrificed, to be sacrificed upon that altar, to be a worthy animal, to be a sacrifice. I mean, don't you guys agree it was a little gory? I don't know. It was a little gory for me. It was an elaborate explanation of all of the sacrifices and offerings that they were to make. It was enough, I think, at that time to make me a vegan right then and there. It was a lot of yucky, icky, icky stuff. So why did he tell us to make the sacrifices and offerings, and now he's saying, I don't require them. I don't require those sacrifices. What I require is obedience. Well, I'm, I'm going to answer that question for you in one word. Love. Because obedience is love, isn't it? Obedience to obey is love. It's all about love. If we go back to our human version of love, which I talked about a little bit, when we, we bring things to each other, that's not our love. That's our expression of our love for each other, right? That's our expression of our love. If I were to say, Ray, we're friends, I love you, I want to bring you a gift and I want to show you my love, that doesn't define my love for Ray as a friend, does it? That doesn't define my love when someone wears a wedding band to show that they're married, that they're in love with the person that they're married to. That doesn't define their love. That's an expression. That's a commitment. But that doesn't define their love for each other, does it? No. No. Your love goes much deeper than that, doesn't it? It's a, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the soul. It's a matter of a decision. It's a matter of making a choice in your mind. By our giving to each other, we're saying, I care enough about you to give this to you. So let's relate that to our love for God. When God set his laws in place and he set up the covenantal system for the Hebrews, where did he do it? He gave them to who first? Moses, right? He gave them to Moses up on Mount Sinai. And he gave him the Ten Commandments and he told him what to say. I am the Lord your God who has set you free from Egypt therefore and then he went into the Ten Commandments and along with the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai <clears throat> Moses got a whole lot more instruction on how the Hebrews were to live their lives didn't he it wasn't just these are the Ten Commandments I'm done now go do these ten things no there was all kinds of stuff that was conveyed up there the whole system of the tabernacle the whole system of the sacrifice and the offerings how the priests were to live their lives, what, we, what they were to wear, what the tabernacle was to look like, what cloth, what colors, all of that information, what, what they could eat, what they could not eat. All of that information was conveyed to Moses and through Moses to the Israelites. The Ten Commandments, translated in the New Testament to a verse that we hear a lot in this church. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those ten commandments are translated in the New Testament into those two things. The first four of the Ten Commandments relate to loving God. The second six relate to loving our neighbors as ourselves. How do we love our neighbors? We don't covet. We don't cheat. We don't steal. That's loving our neighbors. That's not taking advantage of, of other people. That's being honest. That's loving, isn't it? It's loving. When Moses came down off, off of Mount Sinai after having received these commandments, he went to the Hebrews and told them, here is this new covenant that God has given us. And it's, it's written out in Exodus 34, 27. I'll just read it for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and Israel. Now the word covenant is the Hebrew word bereath. And there's some discussion that goes on about the real meaning of the word. But when you get down to the real detail of it, this word bereath, what it means is a pact, a covenant, an agreement that is carried out in a, in a ritual sense to say that we have made this agreement together. Tracy and I come together and we're going to do some kind of business together. We, we write up a contract. We do an agreement. We make a pact that that's the covenant that we're going to keep. This is the covenant that we're talking about when God gave it to the Israelites. But it wasn't a covenant between two people or two groups of people, which would have been, if it was two groups of people, it would have been a bilateral covenant, right? Bilateral meaning two sides, right? I agree and you agree that we're going to come to this agreement, like Tracy and I. No, it was a unilateral agreement, meaning one of the two parties got to say, the details of this covenant. When God gave the Israelites this covenant, it was unilateral. Who got to say how it was going to go down? God, that's right. That's right. He got to say how it was going to go down. And, but we have free will, don't we? We have free will. We can live our lives the way that we want to, but God said, this is my covenant with you, and this is what I would like you to please do to show me you love me. To show me you love me. This is what I would like you to please do, humankind. This is what I want you to do. And this is what I will do for you because I love you. The sacrifices were not and still are not what God really wanted. Let's look at it in a practical way. Everything we have, all of our money, all of our possessions, all of our things, our homes, our cars, every single thing we have is ours because the Lord gave it to us, right? Well, you might say, well, no, that's not true. I earned it at my job. Who gave you the job? God. Well, no. I'm successful in my business, so because of that, you know, I do well, and, and the people there, my bosses, they, they recognize that. They recognize the intellect that I have and how smart I am, and, and that's why I'm successful. Who gave you your intellect? God. Well, no, my family is wealthy. They take care of me. If anything ever happened to me, they would always take care of me. In fact, there's been lots of times where I've needed some help from my mom or my dad or my brother or my sister. Who gave your family the money? Do I need to go on? God allows us to have or to own or to borrow, really. Amen? All the things that we have. Everything. This building. Those chairs. The sound equipment. That guitar. It's not mine. He's letting me borrow it. He's letting me use it. He's letting me use it and give it back to him. To give it back to him. And God gave it all to us. He gave it all to us. What would really be the meaning when we bring sacrifices and offerings to him if it's already his? Right? Well, it's already his. You know, Belinda gives me um, some... Money to borrow. It says here, you know, you need this $10, you can borrow it. 
So two weeks later, I come back and I say, here, Belinda, I'm offering you back this $10. That's not really a sacrifice or an offering, is it? It's not mine. It's hers. It's hers. So what would really be the meaning if we took all these sacrifices and offerings to show him that we love him? No. He doesn't want that from us to show that we love him. This is what he wants. This is what he wants. He wants obedience. He wants our expression of our grateful love for him. He wants us to say, in all things, no matter what's going on, no matter where you are, no matter what you have or what you don't have, no matter if you're at the mountaintop or you're in the valley, no matter if people have forsaken you or hurt your feelings, or you've got all kinds of people around having fun praising you and having fun with them, this is what I want from you. It's Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 22. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer or stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the alien, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your forefathers who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. He wants our lives, church. Lives out, lived out in obedience to be offered up into him. And in John 14, John chapter 14, Jesus said, John 14, 19, In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me because I live, you will live too. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. If we do what Jesus wants us to do, he will love us and he will reveal himself to us. And then down in 1423, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So, we hear from God in the Old Testament. We hear from God, Jesus, in the New Testament. You want to love me? You want to really show me that you love me? Obey me. Do what I want you to do. Do what I ask you to do. That's how you show me that you love me. That's how you show me that you love me. So I want us to think today, in what parts of our lives are we not loving God or are we not being obedient to something that we're supposed to do? This entire theme was woven throughout the retreat and Pastor Tom is preaching right now up in Bradenton about the same theme. And, and people were moved this week. Their lives were changed. People were convicted of things. I was convicted of things that, that I have been asked to do that I have not done, where I was being disobedient, that I need to do this week. Many people were moved in different ways. They shared after each sermon. We had time of sharing. Any less than 100% obedience is what? Disobedience. And another thing, this is something that occurred to me. This is something that we do too. Well, God, you asked me to do something, and 
I didn't do it, so I was disobedient. So, okay, well, that means I'm off the hook. I still don't have to do it. Because since I didn't do it, when you asked me to do it, now I don't have to do it, right? No. No. I mean, when you were a kid and you came home and you hadn't done the chores and you were supposed to do the chores and you hadn't done them by the time you were supposed to have done them, did anybody else do them for you? I hope not. They were still there to be done, weren't they? When we're disobedient and, and God says, um, hello, by the way, you still haven't done that thing I've asked you to do. Well, that's okay, God. I didn't do it, so now I'm off the hook. Uh-uh. No. Nah. It doesn't work that way. It'd be easier if it worked that way, but no, it doesn't work that way. And really, in the long run, it wouldn't be easier because it wouldn't change us. It wouldn't build our character, would it? it? wouldn't build our character. So where are we being disobedient? Where are, be, where are we being unloving to God? Where can we maybe make a change in our life? When the big sailing ships go on races from Fort Lauderdale to Bermuda, you know, the big boats, the, the, um, when they have the races out there in the ocean, they set their course and they get their charts of the ocean and they know where the shoals are and they know where the Bermuda Triangle is, they know to stay away from that. They know, where, they know that they're going to go from point A, Fort Lauderdale, to point B, Bermuda. But when they get that ship out in the water, it's not a straight line, is it? It's not a straight line. Because a ship in the water is affected by all kinds of things. Same as an airplane up in the sky. There are all kinds of things that affect the course of that boat as it makes its way across, aren't there? What do we got? The wind? We've got the current, we've got the tide, other boats might get in our way, the crew, somebody might get sick, so somebody has to pull double duty, something might happen, somebody might fall overboard, that's supposed to pull the sail up. There's all kinds of things that change the direction of that boat. It's not a straight line, one course shot. They have to make corrections to that course, don't they? They have to make corrections, they have to adjust. We're going too far south, adjust to the north. We're going too far east, adjust to the west. We're going too slowly, reset the sail. Where can me, we, we and me, make a course correction today? Where can we make a course correction? It's all kinds of things that affect our course too. All kinds of stuff. Life stuff. Some of it's great, grand, wonderful, good, and some of it's icky, yucky stuff. As my family would say, gunga. That's a Tipton word, gunga. Just means yucky. Stuff happens, doesn't it? It changes our course. But you know what? You keep Christ in your sights. You keep him in your sights. You make your course corrections. Keep him in your sights and you follow him. When you get off course, you get back up, you dust yourself off, and you put your eyes back up and you follow him. He'll pull you back in. He'll reel you back in. He'll show you where to go. Instead of saying what Emily Dickinson said, it's all I have to bring today, this and my heart beside. Let's say today... It's all I have to bring today, this God and my heart and my life. Psalm 40, verse 8. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Amen? Amen.